This is Larry Bauer, Chief Executive Officer of the Family Medicine Education Consortium. And this is a workshop that will provide students, residents, and faculty an opportunity to see the range of uh, leadership opportunities that are available to family physicians. So I'm joined today by Dr. Doug Spots, a family physician who is Vice President and Chief Health Officer of Meredith Health in Mer uh, Hagerstown, Maryland. Doug, thank you very much for joining. Great to be with you, Larry, always. So what I'd really like you to do, Doug, uh, we've known each other a while and I've been terribly impressed by your, your story, your path from where you began uh, to where you are right now. So could you kind of walk us through, take us back to uh, where'd you grow up? What were the choices that you made along the way? And just, you know, share your story of, of how you've developed across the course of your career. Sure. Well, I grew up in central Pennsylvania, just outside a town called Lewisburg that some people are familiar with, Bucknell University, pretty much the geographic center of the state an hour north of Harrisburg in the Susquehanna River Valley. It's really where my family had roots all the way back to the early 1700s when they emigrated from Europe. So I uh, really, really have strong roots there and still maintain them. Um, I early on knew I was one of those kids by about eighth grade that knew I really wanted to uh, pursue medicine. I had others in my family uh, in medicine, many in education, uh, but not an immediate relative uh, in uh, medicine, but I was heavily influenced by my own family physician uh, who really did, you know, was, was there for me the, the whole time growing up. Um, helped my mother bring me into the world. And, uh, you know, I was able to decide eventually uh, to go on and pursue family medicine and was able to come back and uh, join him in practice. The hospital had acquired his practice uh, and I was able and, um, well, educationally went to Juniata College undergrad in Huntington, Pennsylvania, then Penn State College of Medicine um, in Hershey, and then did my residency at Harrisburg Hospital and uh, went into practice with my family physician in 1996. Now, I like to say I was employed, unemployed, and then employed again, because uh, he had sold his practice to the hospital, and I, they had been talking to me through my residency, and I really thought I would settle in there and uh, be practicing in my home community for the, the whole time of my career. Um, Things went well. It was great to really, I feel privileged. I saw sort of an era that was ending and an era that was beginning. Um, and the versatility of family medicine as a part of all of that um, was, was really, really incredible. So I got to practice with this uh, gentleman who was just a tremendous diagnostician. And in my own residency journey, I came through the period of time where Alan Shaughnessy and Dave Slosson were doing some of the early work with evidence-based medicine and poems, and, and they were both at my residency program. Um, revolutionary from a, a technology standpoint was by the time I was chief resident, I had a Palm Pilot in my hand, and I thought that, wow. that, I thought that was incredible. That was hot um, stuff. Right, big stuff. And, um, and then I was able to come back and see a lot of transitions. Um, I, I did pretty much full spectrum family medicine without, I didn't do obstetrics. But I did everything else um, for the first seven years of my career. And then the hospital started to make a transition into hospitalist care and sort of wanted us to focus on outpatient only. I, I wasn't sure how I felt about that. And I wasn't really included in the early part of that discussion. And it led me to sort of seek uh, prior to the direct primary care movement that I know FMEC is involved in. Uh, and explore the idea of maybe I could split out into my own uh, private practice. And so I did that. That was sort of the next step on my, my journey. So I, I was employed the whole time, but I employed myself in that. And really um, during that time, uh, interestingly, was asked to serve as a physician representative on the hospital board. And I was also rising through the ranks of the Pennsylvania Academy of Family Physicians and was uh, sort of on the leadership track and then eventually became a president of the Pennsylvania Academy during that time. 
served as a medical director of a skilled nursing facility right across the street from my office, which sort of gave me a, a continuation of inpatient medicine because a lot more work was shifting into that skilled nursing facility realm uh, and trying to reduce readmissions and, you know, I think and to do really um, good end of life planning and end of life care um, as well for our elderly patients, which has sort of been a passion of mine. And interestingly, um, that led to a conversation with the um, chief uh, operations officer of a small community hospital that still is independent in my hometown, who said, you know, I really liked what you've been saying in meetings, uh, and I really think you should think about getting more into physician leadership. And that conversation, which was going to be just a do you have a moment conversation, turned into an hour-long conversation and then really many conversations to come that sort of uh, propelled me on to taking a part-time role as the first chief medical information officer now remember palm pilot was revolutionary to me so my adult kids would tell you dad you were not the highest technology guy but i was an early adopter in private practice of an electronic health record and I was asked to help really from the clinical perspective, drive conversations between IT and my colleagues. Uh, and that gradually over time uh, increased above 0.5 and I had the hospital come to me and say, you know, you're sort of going over 0.5. We'd like you to do more leadership. You're still doing clinical work, but we'd like to buy your practice. And, you know, it was a little earlier than I thought. Um, and there are certainly aspects that I missed at the time about ownership, but it was actually a good transition. This was all just at the very beginnings of um, the Affordable Care Act and many of the changes uh, brought about, um, you know, during the Obama administration. So uh, that then grew into the chief health information officer where I was reporting both to the CIO and CMO um, around quality, safety, and physician wellness, as well as bridging the uh, clinical improvement of the IT infrastructure. Still practicing uh, pretty much at that point, uh, four days a week, and then it went down to three, and then down to two days a week total. Um, in the meantime, that core group that I had started uh, now includes two other physicians, two PAs and one nurse practitioner, and that group is still together as well as many of the nurses. So I'm quite proud of the fact that they're still doing well uh, and still uh, are doing really good work together, um, you know, uh, at that hospital, which is still independent uh, and collaborative uh, with uh, Geisinger and some of the larger systems up in North Central PA. I wasn't really looking, and you know a little bit of this story, Larry, but I think when you're open to opportunity, I wasn't actively looking, but was probably getting a little bit professionally bored um, through those transitions and sort of had reached the fact that peers were ahead of me in other positions to rise into at that place. So just being open to possibility led to another conversation with a, um, a seasoned physician recruiter, but also a physician leadership uh, facilitator, Carson Dye, who said, I think you should really look uh, at this opening for uh, the then called chief population health officer and vice president position. It's now been changed to chief health officer here at Meritus. It's just about two hours, 10 minutes south of me um, it was a good time as our kids were pretty much launched uh, and on their way professionally. And I really was intrigued by um, sort of taking on population health and seeing what a family physician could bring uh, into, into that um, sort of evolving field, um, both public health, but larger populations and really uh, continuing that work with quality and safety uh, and the linking of what's happening outside the walls of the hospital with um, sort of the right sizing of care that happens within the walls of the hospital. So I'll pause there. I know that that sort of gives a broad background over the last 25 or so years of my career, but it got me to my current position now. Well, that is what got you to your current position, but parallel to that, you were doing work with uh, AAFP, were you not? 
Yes, so I, I mentioned the Pennsylvania Academy uh, tie, and so it's interesting in this part of the world to still be living just four miles over the border in Pennsylvania uh, and still a member of the Pennsylvania Academy. Interestingly, Dr. Wanda Feiler, our colleague that many of us know and our past national president and, and fellow uh, past Pennsylvania Academy president at the time said, you really ought to throw your hat in the ring for a committee or commission. And by the way, there's an opening on the foundation for um, a term that a current member had to resign from. They couldn't fill out the three-year term. And so I threw my hat in the ring at a time that she was uh, the Academy Board representative to the AAFP Foundation Board. And it wasn't because of that, the, the rest of the board you know, voted me in uh, and that was for one year. And then I got elected after that to a term of my own right for three years. And at the end of that term, I was elected to be treasurer, which then started the leadership track to my presidency year of the AAFP Foundation, which uh, completed the end of calendar year 2019. So I was a total combination of uh, just about eight years of service to the AAFP Foundation Board. And the fact that all of that was happening at the time that our kids were um, attending college, graduating college, going on to professional schools, Ian in law school and working in DC, and Hannah now, a first year student at Penn State College of Medicine after her Colgate graduation, was incredible. Sue Ellen, my wife, assures me that I didn't miss any significant event um, in their lives. Uh, oh. Yeah, and, uh, and so, um, but she was certainly the glue that held us together uh, during that. But it was really interesting that all of those things were sort of converging at the same time, but didn't seem to build upon each other and really, I think, help um, define my leadership style, my leadership growth, and I think created uh, the opportunity, including where I'm, where I'm seated right now. So I'm going to bring you back now to Meritus. Uh, I know some of the story, and I think people will be very interesting interested to hear. So you walk in the door, you're going to be the uh, chief of population health. And then a little something extra got thrown on your plate. <laughs> the, the CEO said, hey, we've been toying with this idea of starting a family medicine residency program. And well, it sort of has lived on the osteopathic side. We got some grant money, but we really never had a family physician lead it. We had an internal medicine um, doctor, CMO, who had just recently left uh, the organization and there was an interim CMO there. Um, I, Doug, you're a family doctor. I know you can do it. Um, and by the way, uh, because of the, of the ACGME joint accreditation movement, uh, you know, you've got to do it like in this span of time, like now. <laughs> so uh, challenge accepted and uh, we got fully accredited uh, in April of 2019 and uh, welcomed our first class outside of the match. We had to, to scramble through the soap, but luckily had had some leads on individuals here at Meritus and in the, in the community uh, that were looking for spots and who had worked in one case for Epic in the Epic Go Live here, another case, somebody who was working in risk management and who decided late that he wanted to pursue family medicine uh, rather than internal medicine. And welcomed our second class uh, and are now in this uh, virtual recruitment year of, of COVID, uh, you know, getting our third class. We continued, as you know, some of the colleagues uh, that we recruited for our faculty and are continuing to recruit and building just a, a diverse and strong faculty that is as uh, diverse and strong as our classes of residents. And we are the only uh, rural program in Maryland and um, in the newest program in Maryland. So we're very, very proud of that. And it's uh, not me, it's the team built around me, which uh, is a recurrent theme, I think, in my leadership style. And one of the great joys I get out of position executive leadership is really building up teams um, around me. Um, so it, it's a testament to that team that we sort of, um, built this program, uh, you know, as, as we were moving. And there's just such a need, not only in this region of Maryland, uh, the tri-state area, but in our country, as, as you know, um, to build more uh, family medicine 
workforce and pipeline and capacity. And it's probably turned out to be one of the biggest surprises, yet one of the most professionally rewarding things that I've ever done. That is awesome. And you were just telling me before we started recording this about uh, some of the activities that, that you have planned. I mean, I am really amazed at the ambition of your system and and you. So could you talk with people about that? I think it's a uh, a real testament to your leadership. Well, prior to COVID, we as an organization with our new uh, CEO, so we've had some CEO transition and, uh, and that has been an interesting um, thing after having a relatively stable, long tenured CEO most of my life in this position. Um, the one CEO left, we had an interim CEO and then just prior to COVID, um, our CEO, Malik Joshi, who's a um, doctor of public health, um, came to us and less than 90 days into his tenure as a new CEO, along came COVID. Um, but he brought um, experience uh, from a number of venues, from the National Quality and Safety Institute, from the AHA, and then most recently from his role as Chief Operating Officer of Anne Arundel Health System in Maryland into his first CEO position, a real passion for public health. So we had a retreat um, in Hershey in, um, in the fall of 2019. Uh, David Nash was one of the speakers. It was really all around population health. I got to help plan that retreat. And we started to look at Malik's framework and ideas for setting health, or well, setting bold goals 2030 to sort of align with um, healthy people 2030. I'm leading health. We're using the quadruple aim as our framework. So we have health, health care, joy at work, and financial stewardship or affordability. And so a real quick skinny health care's 2030 bold goal is zero harm. Joy at work is to become the employer of choice. Um, financial stewardship and accountability is to be the lowest cost, highest quality um, healthcare provider in the state of Maryland. And under health, we brought over 40 community stakeholders from the chamber, from the health department, from large employers, from different agencies and organizations, the YMCA, all together in January pre-COVID. And we picked lose a million community pounds by 2030 as our health bold goal. And that was in large part, um, if you Google what Oklahoma City did in 2012, um, they were having uh, an obesity sort of epidemic. Washington County, Maryland is more obese and more diabetic than some of the other counties uh, in Maryland. And Maryland as a state is more obese and diabetic than other states in the United States. And so this really was chosen to align with the Maryland Diabetes Action Plan and uh, and really was was exciting. We were going to launch it. The community campaign in April had started the work internally to Meritus of doing work around healthier food choices in the cafeteria, removing sugar added beverages, getting our employees more active and then COVID came. So it feels really good um, to be sort of continuing to manage COVID importantly in the background, but resuming sort of normal normalcy in our new normal. And I'm excited to say that we are doing our community launch October 6th. Uh, and we're sort of thinking about it in a financial campaign. We're in the quiet phase or silent phase. And then our public launch is October 6th, but we've launched sort of a commitment within the walls of Meritus um, that already has over 290 five users signed up uh, out of our employee workforce of 2,700 and already pounds lost of 750 pounds inside the walls. The community launch is going to allow individuals to sign up or, or organizations and employers to sign up. And we wanted to come into the October 6th event with um, at least 25 community partners pledged to 150,000 pounds committed for that 10 year campaign, or at least uh, a little over you know, one tenth of our goal. 
So we have, as of today, 14 uh, organizations pledged at 110,000 pounds before our October 6th. So I've been doing a lot of work uh, meeting with people by Zoom or in person when we can socially distance under Maryland guidelines for phase three reopening. And it feels just awfully good as a family physician to be back out uh, in the community, forming those relationships and those ties uh, and getting people excited about this. We know that obesity, diabetes, chronic illness, all are impacted by this. And so it's a really big focus for 10 years. And then each, each fiscal year, we have goals that we're targeting. So this year, it's really around getting the campaign infrastructure up and running. Um, we have other parts of it, addressing social determinants of health and uh, increasing activity. And we'll, we'll do more of that each year as we roll out each fiscal year um, for the 10 year campaign. So that's what we're that's doing. Awesome. That yeah. is awesome. So Doug, in the last uh, couple minutes that we have here uh, for this um, recording, what would you, what, what's your recommendations to students, residents, or faculty who are thinking about stepping their toes into the leadership waters and uh, uh, seeing how uh, they might uh, act out their philosophy of care? Well, I, I would say um, we need more family doctors in leadership roles. And if you want to dip your toe in the water, um, really good way to do it and we often are asked to do it is through our own hospital systems, being on the medical executive committee or in different leadership positions there. Um, community boards are always looking for the advice of a physician, um, sometimes wrongly assume that we know everything about everything. <laughs> but I think family doctors are uniquely positioned because we know what we know and we know how to access what we don't know and how to bring people together and how to advocate, advocate for um, finding solutions to problems. Um, I mentioned advocacy so you can get involved in state and national professional organizations like the State Academy is a national academy and of course Larry FMEC has lots of leadership opportunity as, as well and I, I would just encourage everyone that if they want uh, to or they're considering dipping their toe in the water that you can start there. Um, be open to conversations and I think there's a real role for mentoring and looking to family doctors that are serving in leadership positions and forming relationships, having a coffee together, um, even a Zoom meeting or a virtual meeting right now, um, depending on, on our COVID you know, status and, and situation, but reaching out um, and forming that network. And you know, it doesn't mean that you have to go on and become fully uh, into a physician executive position you can do that and still maintain clinical presence. So I love the part of my week that gets to teach the residents and precept the residents and still be uh, doing a little bit of clinical work. That's just something that was important to me. Um, so there's many ways uh, to do it. I've just given some examples of how to do that. But I think family doctors really are uniquely positioned because of all the reasons I just said, we, we know how to form the relationships. We're about the relationships. And whether it's the local um, hospital, the community board, the bank board, the um, C-suite, or many other positions, I think that we really need the voice of family medicine and primary care to be represented. I agree with you more. So I wanna thank you, Doug, for um, sharing your thoughts and sharing your story. Uh, it's one that I think uh, is, is really inspirational. You, you, you're just doing great things. And I have the blessing of knowing uh, most of your team that you've recruited. And all I can say is, well done. Uh, you have an incredible team. And um, the folks who train with you uh, as residents uh, are just going to have a wonderful experience. So thank you for uh, joining with us uh, today. Thank you, Larry. Hi, this is Larry Bauer, Chief Executive Officer of the Family Medicine Education Consortium, and I'm excited today to be talking to Dr. Sam Zager, who's a family physician in Portland, Maine. He works at Martins Point Healthcare. Uh, Sam, it's uh, great to be talking with you. 
Thank you so much, Larry. It's really an honor. I, I very much appreciate all the work you've done with FMAC over the years, and it's great to be here. Thank you. So I think we'll start with the exciting news and then maybe work backwards. So you've run for office in the state of Maine, and you succeeded. Tell us about that. Uh, well, indeed, um, it's it's a bit of an, a new endeavor. Um, I this summer prevailed in a, a primary, uh, and it, the way this uh, district here in Maine works out, uh, it's an unopposed general election. So the primary uh, was the election in essence. So uh, unless uh, uh, as long as I keep breathing, I will uh, presumably take a seat in the 130th Maine Legislature in December. Is awesome, and um, can I ask uh, which side of the uh, um, political world, Democrat, Republican? I'm a Democrat. I uh, invite people uh, to visit my campaign website at samzager.org. That's S-A-M-Z as in zebra, A-G-E-R dot org, uh, and it's got all sorts of uh, information about uh, my. Um, uh, party affiliation, as well as uh, my background and the issues that are important to me. So speaking of background, why don't you tell people a little bit about your background? Maybe go back before medical school? Sure. I, I guess you would say that I'm one of the unconventional, uh, I was one of the unconventional medical students. It's, it's, medicine is a second career for me. I actually spent 11 years in uniform. I was in the Navy. I, uh, six days after high school graduation, took the oath of office as a midshipman at the United States Naval Academy and then served for seven years, both afloat and ashore uh, in the Naval Service. I, during my younger, you know, my, my teenage years, I, I uh, had a very strong conviction that I wanted to serve, be of service to those around me. And military service, I recognized was merely one form of, of service. It happened to be what most spoke to me at the time, but uh, a few of uh, events and, and uh, things um, happened over the years, and I eventually, I guess, felt a, a, another calling. And um, I can distinctly remember the, uh, a, a moment where it, it really crystallized for me, uh, and I resolved um, it, uh, to become a doctor. Uh, I didn't know what kind of doctor. I didn't know what being a doctor really entailed. I just felt a, a deep conviction that uh, this was going to be uh, the next chapter in my uh, service to those around me. And I ended up falling in love with it. And I ended up falling in love with family medicine. And so that's what I do. And where did you go to medical school? I went to Harvard, Harvard Medical School. Your, your residency? My residency I completed at, uh, at Maine Medical Center, uh, which is a phenomenal program. I'd be happy to talk to anybody who has an interest in, uh, in family medicine about the program. Um, I'm very honored to, um, to have been a graduate and also to have been, uh, had a role in helping to train medical students and uh, residents over the years. And you told me a piece of information a short time ago about the role the FMEC meeting played in your career development? Yes. Um, well, so it's probably no secret uh, to your listeners that um, Harvard um, does not produce tons of family doctors um, historically. However, uh, that doesn't mean that somebody can't fall in love with family medicine um, in, in, in such a so-called orphan school. Um, and I found that um, Talk, I, I learned of FMEC and the um, and, and other associations of family doctors from the, the family docs um, in Boston that I that I got to meet. Uh, Kathy Miller, uh, one of my chief mentors, uh, who, who I think you know, and I started attending the conferences, and uh, I remember going to. Uh, I think I, I think I, I went to six or eight in a row, uh, and uh, just found my home. I felt like uh, the the diversity of uh, of the, the folks that attended, the uh, um, creativity, the commitment, the uh, the devotion that people had to their communities, 
all sorts of communities uh, as from Virginia and DC North and here in Maine and from Ohio, Ohio East. I, I, I just got to meet people from all sorts of communities serving as family doctors in all sorts of capacities and it really excited me. Uh, so that was part of, um, of how uh, FMEC helped me grow as a, as a family doctor, as, a, as, a, as an aspiring family doctor. And it also was a forum uh, for, for thought um, of uh, way, new ways of doing things, uh, such as looking at a member that there was a, um, a, uh, a keynote um, about hot spots in Camden, New Jersey. Uh, that was you know, profound to me. I, I remember uh, all sorts of, of things uh, that, that, I, you know, that, that this forum of thought um, that FMEC brought, convened was, was really important, I, I, I believe, uh, because family doctors fundamentally are rooted in, in, in our communities. And there are so many needs that communities have and so many uh, ways that a, a family doc can contribute to, to their own community. Uh, it was as well a form for me to bring uh, my own ideas up. Uh, and I can remember um, many, well, sometime, se several times uh, presenting at, at FMEC conferences. And uh, that was another way that I, I think it helped me grow as, as, a, as, a, as a, uh, a trainee and a physician. Um, because doctors not only treat people, but also co collaborate to figure out ways of doing things and that that requires a forum um, and FMEC has been a, a, a terrific forum uh, for me and many other people. So, Sam why don't you tell folks a little bit about your your practice situation what are you doing uh, as a family physician in your community? I have basically two practices and then there's there, there's my advocacy work. I consider all of that within the realm of my practice of medicine. Uh, I'm a, I'm a uh, generalist, uh, so my practice, uh, you know, I, I see adults and kids uh, at Martins Point, which is here in Portland, and um, I also, uh, I, I do uh, procedures, um, skin procedures, vasectomies, um, and that's, that's an important part of my, um, my, 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 my uh, identity as a family doc is, is helping people make decisions. Um, throughout the life cycle that, that are, are right for them. I also serve as a family physician at our local high school. Deering High School is, uh, is, is, uh, is three quarters of a mile from, from our house. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful place. Uh, and being an embedded doctor in the school-based health centers, which in itself is a very interesting model uh, of care, where you're 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 in the schools, you're part of the school community, you're 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 aware of the rhythms of the school community, it's hugely valuable. Uh, it also, as as somebody who who has been the, the chair of our of, of our of our practices uh, resiliency committee, uh, I have found that having a the diversity of ways that a person can be a doctor as a family doctor helps support my own spirit and helps me, uh, I think, it protects me against burnout. Uh, and practicing uh, in, in the, the pro bono work that I do at, at, at the school-based health centers, as well as the uh, variety of ways that I practice at, uh, at, at Martins Point um, are all part of that for me. I should also mention here in Maine and, 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 and in so many communities, uh, states and, and communities across the country, we have a, an awful um, opioid epidemic um, still, even, even though COVID is, is uh, rightly on the top of people's minds, um, we still have tremendous uh, need for those services. And, that, and that's something that I have been involved with uh, and it's part of my practice uh, for, for uh, many years now. Great. So how'd you get involved in advocacy work? What got you going? The first advocacy work I think I, I, I would, uh, really that I did um, was about in, uh, 10 years ago now, oh gosh, <laughs> it's hard to believe. Uh, but 10 years ago, I was, uh, I was a medical student in Boston and I heard that there was a proposal to save money uh, in the, the city budget by cutting the library budget. 
and initially it, that seemed to make sense. Uh, this was in the, in the aftermath of the, the uh, financial meltdown, from the 2008 financial meltdown and, and local government was struggling. But as I, I found out more about it, um, it was not done in an equitable, equitable fashion. And the proposal would have shut down library branches in uh, poorer and less educated, uh, less advantaged neighborhoods. I, it, it, that just didn't seem fair, didn't seem right. And I joined a, a grassroots organization, just some community folks, community members that wanted to get together and oppose this sort of approach. And I happened to be the only one there from, the, you know, who was a, who was a, you know, in medical training. Although there was a psychologist um, who was who, named Brandon Abs who was uh, spearheading it. Um, but uh, I said at some at some point early on, I said, "What if we, as part of this effort, uh, in addition to the moral argument, also marshaled a health argument, a public health argument, that libraries are good for their communities?" And like I think a, a, a physician needs to do, um, had to turn to the evidence. So I so I dove into PubMed and the literature on what is written about libraries and health. <laughs> and literacy and where did these all intersect and found that there was a body of, 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 uh, of, of work, not about libraries per se, but about literacy and about social uh, connections, about how um, social ties that people have in their communities are really important to health. So I developed a one pager, uh, an evidence-based one pager with, with about two pages of, of footnotes based in the medical and public health literature and went all around Boston uh, talking to whoever I could find in, the, in, in the, uh, the health establishment in Boston. These are uh, deans of medical schools and uh, people who, you know, there was somebody who had uh, uh, you know, received a Nobel Prize, uh, in Nobel Peace Prize, they're, they're, these were, People who had received the national, uh, uh, you know, national, um, uh, national scientific awards, prominent people in healthcare, to see if they would agree with this one pager, this uh, essentially consensus statement on the value of libraries for communities and the value of libraries for health. The two, the two mechanisms, chiefly being through literacy and through social connections, and. I was pleased to find that every single person that I approached uh, believed you know, believe that this message was important, that it was timely, and that it was evidence-based. So I, uh, I collected their, this, these, the co-signatories and presented it to the, uh, uh, the um, city council, Boston City Council. This would have been in June of 2010. And it was one of the components that seemed to win the day. I, I, I certainly can't take credit for, for the whole thing. I think if anyone would, that would be Brandon Apps and, and the folks that were more centrally involved in it. But the health piece was a novel approach. And as far as I can tell, and I've, I've been looking at this for, you know, subsequently, because I ended up doing some, some, um, some research in residency. My residency project, uh, research project was on this as well, subsequently. And I, um, as far as I can tell, it was the world's first consensus statement about the intersection of health and public libraries and how uh, libraries are central to their communities. That literature and that line of thinking has actually taken off in the last decade. Um, but I, I, I have to point to that as the beginning of my, my involvement, uh, community advocacy involvement, um, at, and it was at the local level, and it was something that was kind of avant-garde as far as the me medical literature is concerned. Wow, that's a pretty cool story. So maybe you can send a copy of that uh, one pager to me, and we can make that available to people if they, if they would like that. Sure. So we're happy yep, to spread that around. And so from there, what... Well, how did you evolve uh, in your advocacy work and what made you decide to run for office? Well, I, um, there was a little hiatus there because I went to, you know, I graduated and had to go to, uh, you know, I, I did residency training, which, um, 
was fantastic in its own right, but I didn't do a whole lot of advocacy and residency. What I did do, do is um, some more research. Um, and I ended up doing a collaborative research project with uh, Maine Health, which was where the organization that, the parent organization of our residency. And the local public library, the Portland Public Library, and this also was a novel approach to, um, and this was IRB approved uh, and, uh, to combine, to do a retrospective study, to look at quantitatively, for the first time, to quantitatively look at the, um, the intersection of health and li public libraries. And because I had, in doing the, 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 the one pager in Boston, I, there was an evidence basis, but it was, it was not uh, quantified. It was not, uh, in, not as direct as I was really looking for. And as, as, as we, we do when we, when we see that there's a gap in the literature, we try to fill it. So I, I, I tried to do that um, and uh, ended up uh, uh, publishing it uh, um, in 2014 and it got published. Um, I had grad finished residency by that point. Um, but I, I took a little, I guess, hiatus from advocacy and I wasn't planning to do a whole lot of advocacy um, as a, in the way that I am now, I really just was was responding to what I saw around me and how, how I was moved to get involved. But um, after I started practice uh, and um, saw over and over and over again how the things that we try to address as family doctors um, are, have so many upstream factors that affect them, whether it's access to healthcare, uh, equitable access to healthcare, whether it's um, the way um, the, the, the environmental decisions we make or, or um, if, you know, the, you know, if it's a you know, gun, gun safety issue. I mean, there's so many things that affect the, the, the issues that matter to our patients that I started to look upstream at those factors and realize that a lot of decisions that are affecting the patient in front of me were actually, the decisions were made at the state level months or years or even decades earlier. So I started to speak up um, and write op-eds and testify at hearings and organize other, other um, doctors and other health, allied health professionals. It, an organization called Maine Providers Standing Up for Healthcare uh, really took off in 2017, early, early in 2017, uh, and I became very involved in that and ultimately uh, led that. Uh, for for some years, uh, and the, the website there is uh, standupme.org. Standupme as in Maine. Uh, org. Uh, so people can see what what uh, what that uh, all those efforts had had to do with, uh, and that was both at the state level and then the national level. Because in in Maine we had uh, Senator Susan Collins, um, um, who was a, a key vote in 2017 when the Affordable Care Act was being threatened. Uh, there were three key votes in that year that um, really depended on three Republican senators. Uh, all, all, all that was needed was three Republican senators to oppose the, uh, the repeal bills that had a lot of um, GOP energy behind them. And Senator Collins was, was one of them that, uh, that went against her party. And so our, our, that was, she said, in large part because she was listening to healthcare providers and uh, listening to the, the patients in her state. And we, uh, Maine Provider Standing Up for Healthcare was, uh, was singularly focused at that time on her vote on those issues to protect the Affordable Care Act. Since then, uh, there was Maine Care, or what, which is our version of Medicaid expansion, uh, which we expanded at the ballot box. We were the first state to do ma uh, Medicaid expansion at the ballot box. That's, that's one, of the, uh, one of the elements of the Affordable Care Act that permits states to expand uh, Medicaid. And uh, we did that at the ballot box. Um, and our organization was part of the grassroots door-to-door -door and, and uh, campaign that, um, that was, was part of the coalition that helped do that. We've done a lot of stuff for... Um, uh, reproductive rights and uh, and uh, have tried to uh, stand up for issues of pertaining to children's health as well. Uh, so people can go to standupme.org to get more on, on that story. Uh, and then outside of that organization, I, I did some other advocacy work, um, you know, for instance, about uh, 
gun safety that's you know with with all the 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 awful deaths that that occur um, from from firearms uh, suicide homicide uh, just all sorts of awful d domestic violence um, connection uh, certainly the being in schools and this and school shootings uh, uh, influenced my thinking on that as well and uh, so I, I I weighed in on that so even even outside of the main provider standing up for healthcare, I found myself feeling compelled, feeling like somebody's got to speak up and, and maybe I have something to, to say about, about um, what ended up being about a dozen different issues. And at a certain point, people turned to me and said, you know, you, you, Sam, you, you keep showing up at, at these hearings and you, and you keep writing things that have some, get, get traction. Why don't you consider running yourself as a state rep or something? And so I thought about it and tried to think about how I could integrate that into my practice and my, uh, and, and my family life. And, um, hey kiddo. Hi. <laughs> I know you're going to go to big sky. Okay. I'm, I'm in the middle of an interview, but that sounds great. Yeah, I know, but like Mara's in the bring me okay. to. Uh -oh. This is my daughter, Daphne. <laughs> Hi Daphne. Hi. Have fun. So Sam, I want to bring things to uh, closure here. So how does it, how does it feel to be, uh, you figured out obviously a way for, to maintain your practice and, and to be uh, involved in uh, uh, the state legislature. So how does that feel? I have uh, a whole variety of feelings. Um, it's, it's, it's an incredible honor uh, and to, to have the trust of the voters in this district um, to represent uh, this district in the, in the legislature. It's, it's very humbling. Um, it's also a bit scary. Uh, I feel the weight of all the issues that we experience as a community, as a state, uh, and, and, and certainly in this country. It's not unlike being a doctor who is sitting there with, with, with a, a patient or a family in your, in your exam room and you, you uh, take on the burden of their problems. You, you are there, uh, you know, whether it's home visit or whether it's sitting in your exam room, you're, you're there with people in moments of, of uh, um, tremendous gravity. And so I, I feel that for the issues that are facing our community. Um, I, I'm also um, very excited because I, I know that there are ways through all of this, just like in the military, and when you know we would navigate a ship through uh, shoal waters, there's there's certainly dangers out there, but there's but also by being evidence based, by working together, by staying focused on the ultimate goal, um, there's a way to get through things safely. And so I do believe that as 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 colossal as the issues that we're facing, climate change, and um, and and our, uh, racial um, dis uh, and, and ethnic oppression and disparities, uh, among a host of other issues, even though these issues are colossal, I, I do believe that there is a way forward and that we can truly, by working together uh, in government, help people live their best lives. And that's, so that's what I'm, what I'm trying to do, is, is fold that into my practice of medicine. So I just think uh, what you're doing is fantastic. And um, I'm hoping that others may hear this interview and appreciate the opportunities that are available. And, and I think Family Docs, with your generalist expertise and your uh, strong interpersonal skills, have, have a great deal to offer um, at a whole variety of levels. So I, I want to thank you, Sam, for uh, uh, spending some time uh, with me today. And uh, I wish you good luck. And, and I'm going to uh, uh, stay in touch uh, and kind of see how things are going. I'm, f I'm fascinated by what you're doing. I really appreciate it, Larry. I, I would also just like to quickly say one thing, which is uh, an appeal to any of your listeners of how much credibility family doctors have in government. Uh, and I, I know that a lot of times family doctors don't see themselves as the real experts. And I think that's, um, uh, it doesn't have to be like that because family doctors are experts in human beings, experts in our communities, experts in medicine and science. 
Uh, and because we, we of, of the oath that we take, the Hippocratic oath that we take, and the way that we live that through our devotion to our patients and our devotion to our practice and always honing and refining and improving the practice of medicine, we have incredible credibility when we testify, when we call our legislators, when we write a, a, an opinion piece in our, in our local newspaper, people really do listen to family doctors um, because of who we are and what we do with, with all our, our labors and our efforts. So I, will, I, will, I, will, I hope that people will take that on board. And I would love to hear from anybody who has uh, any thoughts about that or would like guidance or suggestions on how to best do that in their own communities. People can uh, email me at samzager uh, at gmail.com. And um, I would love to hear from other family docs or um, you know, residents, uh, students, um, or, or other folks who, who, are, who are in the FMEC uh, universe um, and would like to get more involved uh, because it's so much easier than people think. It's far easier <laughs> than, than anything we, we do in, um, on rounds or, or in, in clinic um, in, in terms of uh, having, having um, an impact and, and a lot of credibility. Fantastic. Sam, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Larry.